morning. Good morning. My name is David Hyde. I'm the pastor here at Park Street United Methodist Church. We are glad to have you in worship with us today. I want to welcome those of you that are here worshiping in person and those of you that are joining us at home and online as well. At this time, I want to invite you, uh, if you would, please stand as we sing the first two verses of our opening hymn, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strength.
faith together with the Apostles' Creed, found on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Today is, uh, well, tomorrow is Memorial Day, it's Memorial Day weekend, uh, and as we, uh, we pray today, our, our prayer is offered on behalf of, of all of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for us and for our, our nation, uh, and so as we bow our heads, let us do so in remembrance of Almighty God, before whom stand the living and the dead, we, your children, whose mortal life is but a hand's breadth, give thanks to you. For all those through whom you have blessed our pilgrimage, whose lives have empowered us, whose influence is a healing grace, we lift up thankful hearts. For the dear friends and family members whose faces we see no more, but whose love is with us forever. 
we lift up thankful hearts. For the teachers and companions of our childhood and youth, and for the members of our household of faith who worship you now in heaven, we lift up thankful hearts. For those who sacrifice themselves, our brothers and sisters who have given their lives for the sake of others, we lift up thankful hearts. That we may hold them all in continual remembrance and ever think of them as with you in that city whose gates are not shut by day and where there is no night. We lift up thankful hearts that we may now be dedicated to working for a world where labor is rewarded, fear dispelled, and the nations made one. O oh Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. Day by day, we magnify you and worship your name forever and ever. For we pray all of these things today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we are continuing today with our sermon series entitled Creed, where we've been taking a look at the Apostles' Creed, what it says, what it means, and how it can, how it should, shape the lives that we live as followers of Jesus. 
For those of you that were, were here last week or happened to, to catch the sermon online, you may remember that we took a look at the line in the creed, the forgiveness of sins. And sin, we said, is it, something that all of us have to deal with. None of us are immune to the effects of sin. Beyond that, we also said that, that sin is more than just some, some bad action we might commit. Instead, it, it's often more like a, a force within our lives, something that we always have to, to fight against. Our, our wills have been changed. The image of God that we were created in has been distorted. And that's what forgiveness then is about. Forgiveness, forgiveness from, from God that comes through Jesus Christ is about more than just, just letting our bygones be bygones. It's about recovering the image in which we were created. It's about being reformed and, and remade. And it's this, this forgiveness from God, we said, that should then inspire us to forgive one another. Ultimately, we, we said that we talk about sin not because we want to make ourselves or, or make others feel guilty, but rather so we can understand the depth of God's love, God's compassion for us. When we learn to forgive as God forgives, we help to, to reform, to remake the image of love and compassion that God created us in. As we move into this morning, I want to invite you, as I always do, to take out your order of worship sheets. On the back, you'll find some fill-in-the-blanks and a spot to take some notes. I want you to have that out today. I feel sure that God will speak at some point in some way as we go through these next few moments together. So today is the day of Pentecost. It's the day in which we remember the gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church. And I, I mentioned a few weeks ago when we discussed the Holy Spirit that, that all of the lines in the creed from then on would reflect the Spirit and the Spirit's work. And today is no exception to that. Resurrection power comes from the Holy Spirit. And so as we, we talk this morning about resurrection, I want us to, to keep that in mind. We're going to be uh, talking a little bit more about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit next week again, but, uh, but for now I want us to keep in mind that, that what it might mean for us to be gifted this, this same power, this same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I believe in the resurrection of the body. It's one of the, the defining statements of who we are as followers of Christ. So when we say this, this line, when we, when we speak this line, what are we referring to? What does it really mean? What does it matter? And, and how, how should it, how, how can it change the way that we live and we act in the world? So one thing up front when we speak the words, I believe in the resurrection of the body, we have to remember that we are talking not only about what happened to Jesus on that first Easter morning, but we're also talking about a future hope. When we discussed Jesus in the, the context of the creed, we didn't, we didn't get a chance to go through every single one of those lines, but, but part of what we say is that we believe that Jesus was put to death on the cross, that he died, and that on the third day he rose from the dead. But when we speak about resurrection, we must also remember that resurrection is not only talking about Jesus, it's talking about a future hope that we put our faith in as well. We'll be returning to that in just a minute. So depending on where you look, what you read, how you were brought up, whether you, you grew up in the church, which church you grew up in, the resurrection might have the different meanings for you. 
Now, there's a lot of ideas and opinions that exist out there, and, and one of those opinions, one of those ideas is that, is that when we speak about the resurrection, we're actually speaking in metaphors. Somebody who has, has this opinion might agree that, that on the first Easter morning, something happened. They might even say that, that what happened, what took place, that morning had never happened before or, or that it's never happened since. That something one-off and truly extraordinary took place. But that this something that took place was not the body of Jesus actually physically rising from the dead. This, this idea of a, a spiritual resurrection is not a, a new one. It's been around for, for about as long as, as Christianity itself. And, and in a lot of ways, I guess it kind of makes sense, right? Dead people don't live again. We know that. They don't get up after they're dead and, and walk off. It also kind of mirrors what a majority of Christians already believe about death in the afterlife. One of the most common Thoughts, ideas in Christianity is that, that when one dies, their spirit leaves their body and it heads off to some, to some eternal spiritual dwelling, right? Heaven, hell, whatever you want to call it. And if you already believe that, well, then it, it's not really that big of a leap to say that that's what happened with Jesus. A spiritual resurrection. That's what God's preparing for. There's just one problem with that. That's not what we confess in the creed, is it? The creed doesn't say, I believe in the resurrection of the Spirit. It doesn't say, I believe in the immortal soul or the, the Spirit that will dwell in heaven. No, that, that's not what we profess. That's not what we proclaim as followers of Christ. So what then do we profess? Does it really matter? I, I think it does. You see, what we actually profess is that we believe in the resurrection of the body. And when we, when we say those words, we say them with the belief that the body, the actual physical body of Jesus, was raised from the dead. We believe that on that, that first Easter Sunday morning, the, the followers of Jesus, they, they went to the tomb and they looked in and they found that tomb to be empty. Completely empty. Not only do, do I profess that, not only do I believe that, but, but I believe this to be the, the absolute fulfillment of God's promises to us. The resurrection of the body is the linchpin. It is, it is the key upon which everything else is built. The Apostle Paul thought so too. We heard a, a couple of moments ago uh, from his first letter to the church in Corinth. And, and in that letter, Paul is addressing those within the community, those within the church, who are denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Hear these words again that Paul writes. Paul, Paul says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain and your faith is in vain. One of my, my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, says this about the resurrection. He puts it. Puts it this way. He says, anyone who is in any sense a Christian cannot with any consistency believe that Jesus stayed dead. Serious Christianity begins when Jesus comes out of the tomb on Easter morning. He's saying what Paul's saying, right? He's making the same point. If we don't believe this, 
If we don't believe that Jesus' body really and truly was raised from the dead, then what is the point of the message that we're proclaiming? The resurrection of Jesus' body is important, and it's important because it's the foundation upon which everything else we believe is built. I mean, think about it this way. Okay? In, in Christianity, we, we have this tendency, right, to, to look to the cross, don't we? And, and there's a lot that, that believe that the, the cross itself is enough to show us God's love. They would say that, that really and truly it's the cross that, that speaks the loudest. It's the, the cross that, that shows us that God's work is completed. But when we read in the Bible, no one in the crowd, no one who, who saw Jesus' body being taken down from the cross, no one in that moment thought of Jesus' death as the fulfillment of God's promise, did they? No now, the point of the story, the, the cornerstone of all that we hold on to, it begins at the site of the empty tomb. It begins with the resurrection of Jesus' body. Now, it, it's true that the cross is important. And it, it's true that the, the cross plays a vital role in, in all that happens. After all, if it, if it weren't for the cross, there wouldn't be an empty tomb, would there? But the cross only means what it means in light of the empty tomb. The cross only stands for what it stands for in light of the resurrection. The cross is only significant to us because Jesus was raised from the dead. If Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, the, the cross would, would simply still be a, a symbol of torture and, and punishment. But because Jesus was raised, because the, the tomb was found empty, the cross now carries with it a completely different power. The cross, you see, is, is the moment in which evil finally comes to a head. It's the moment in which the powers of darkness are, are closest at hand. The, the evils of the world all gather up in this, this one place. And in that moment of Jesus' death upon the cross, their power peaks. Evil believes it's won. And evil would have won if the body that was laid in the tomb had stayed in the tomb. Adam Hamilton writes this. He says, if, if Christ was not raised, then evil, hate, sin, and death have the final word. But Jesus' resurrection was God's dramatic way of making clear that none of these things really have the final word. He calls it God's response to all that's wrong with the world. Another author puts it this way. He says, the, the resurrection of, of Jesus displaces forever the iron grip that the unseen forces of evil has on not only Israel, but on the whole world. What all this means is that the resurrection, the empty tomb, Easter Sunday morning, it is the ultimate defeat of evil. It's the moment when, when Jesus does what he's been doing throughout his whole life. He, he watches and he waits until, until the powers that be all gather in one place and rise up together. And then, then when they're least expecting it, he expels them. That's the good news of the gospel. That darkness and, and evil and, and death no longer have any power over. But that instead, God's kingdom now reigns. The powers that be have been defeated. And God's, God's ultimate plan of making this kingdom on earth as it is in heaven has begun. If the tomb isn't empty, none of this makes any sense. It's why the resurrection of Jesus is so important. Because, because without it, all that I preach would be true. All that you proclaim would be for naught. The death of God's Son would be for naught. 
But this line about the resurrection of the body, it, it doesn't just apply to, to Jesus. Now, as I said at the beginning, it, it applies to us as well. It applies to a, a future hope that we have. We're not just talking about Jesus' body. We're talking about our own bodies. We as, as Christians believe that the, because Jesus was raised, that we too will one day be raised. That we too will, will one day be resurrected into the new creation that God blesses us with. Paul writes in another of his letters, this one to the church in Rome. He says, therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in newness of through Jesus, we ourselves are put to death, and through him, we ourselves will be raised. I'm going to go into a greater detail about that in another week or so, but, but just know that when we, when we speak of the resurrection of the body, it's not just about Easter. It's not just about Jesus that we're, we're talking about. It's about us. It's about our resurrection So then, how, how does all this affect the way that we live and act? What does it mean? Well, if, if Jesus has defeated sin and death, then that means that those things no longer have any sort of hold on us. It means that we are now free to live the way God intended for us to live. We know that God is not done with creation, that God is not done with us. We, we know that who we are now in this moment is not who we will always be. <coughs> in other words, we believe, because we believe in the resurrection of the body, because we believe that, that God is at work doing something new, because of that, we can give of ourselves in ways that would otherwise seem ridiculous. I mean, just think about it. If this life that we have now is all that there is, I mean, it, it doesn't make much sense to be selfless, does it? It doesn't make much sense to be giving or, or for giving. There wouldn't be a, a reason for those who, who pledge a life of poverty or, or service to others to exist. I mean, if this is all we've got... Why would we do that? But if we understand that this life isn't it, if we understand that that new life awaits, well then suddenly giving of ourselves in this life doesn't seem so outrageous, does it? Or how about this? Can you imagine what it would look like for us, all of us, to live without the fear of failure? To live without the fear of ridicule. What if, what if we were no longer scared to, to make decisions out of love, regardless of their, their financial or their social impact? What would it mean to, to make decisions based on the well-being of someone else instead of, instead of our own well-being? That's what the resurrection of the body means for us. It means that we can once again live the way God intended for us to live. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And yet, as we've said over and over and over again, belief has to also inspire our actions. So how is the good news of love the wholeness being made manifest in your life? How are you living selflessly for the sake of someone else? How are you, you putting aside your, your own weights, your own concerns, 
in order to stand with those who have little or, or no voice at all. In other words, how are you, how am I, how are we living out the resurrection? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the promise of resurrection. Help us to see that because of this this new life you offer to us, we can now give more freely, love more fully, and act more boldly. Lead us, Lord, to action. Action that speaks to the entirety of your love for us and for the world. For it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. I invite you now to please stand with me as we join in singing our hymn, number 369. Western North Carolina. So if you, you 
uh, want to come forward um, at the end of the worship service or on your way out today. I uh, invite you to leave that, that special offering in there. Uh, but for now, I want to invite our ushers to please come forward as we take up our, our normal tithes and offerings. <laughs> before our final hymn. Uh, next Sunday, we will be celebrating confirmation here uh, on uh, in the 11 o'clock service. We have three young adults who are going to be professing their faith and, and joining the church next week. So I uh, just encourage you to, to come out next Sunday, be here as we support them uh, and support their families as well. We look forward to that. It's always a, a great, great time celebrating confirmation Sunday. As we, uh, we close, uh, let us do so with our final hymn, 413, A Charge to Keep I Have. <laughs>
now this blessing benediction. May you go forth in peace, the love of God, the grace of His Son, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May they be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.